2014 would have been the year of Sierra Lamar's graduation from Sobrato High School in California. But instead of celebrating such a big milestone with her family and friends, a seat was left empty at the ceremony in her honor, as one man robbed her of her future and will be paying the price with the rest of his life. This is a true crime case that left investigators begging for answers, and detectives were doing everything they could to collect enough evidence to bring this man to justice. And as fate would have it, one surprising turn of events finally gave police the answers they'd been hoping for. Back in 2014, Sierra Lamar was living with her mother, Marlene, and Marlene's boyfriend in Morgan Hill after she'd relocated there from Fremont. Although she wasn't thrilled at the prospect of moving to a new area, Sierra was doing well in school, where she also took part in cheerleading. Sierra is said to have had the ability to make anyone laugh. She fit in very well with the other students at her new school, and she had a very friendly personality that was easy to get along with. Almost immediately after enrolling at Sobrato, she started making friends, and before long, her social life was blossoming. Sierra was, by all means, having a great time, and unexpectedly so. Sierra and Marlene had a regular schedule. They would get up at 6 a.m. and then start getting ready for school and work. Marlene's boyfriend would typically leave the house to go to work before they did, and the morning of Friday, March 16th, 2012, was no different. Marlene would leave for work, and Sierra would walk to her bus stop, which was just down the road from their house at around 7.15 a.m. Ten minutes later, she would get on the bus. Interestingly, this was an unmarked bus stop, since Sierra was the only student to be picked up from that spot. Usually, when the bus dropped Sierra off in the afternoon, she would get home long before her mother, meaning when Marlene got back, Sierra would already be home waiting for her every day. While this particular morning played out like most others, that afternoon was very different. That's because when Marlene got home from work, Sierra was nowhere to be found. I've personally been the victim of theft more than once in my life, and a few years back, my information was stolen by online hackers. Several of my family members have been in the same boat, but things don't have to be this way. For today's video, I teamed up with Aura, an industry leader in cybersecurity. One thing that really bothers me is that data brokers sell your information to scammers, robocallers, pretty much anyone. This is one of the reasons you get so many spam emails and all those annoying calls about your car's extended warranty. These people have access to things like your full name, your email, your address, maybe even your health records. But this is why I've been using Aura, today's sponsor. Aura can help you make sense of what data may have been stolen as well as show you which data brokers may be selling your information right now. They'll even send in opt-out requests on your behalf so you don't have to lift a finger. This helps you reduce how much spam you get and also protects you from hackers who may use this information to steal your social media accounts or even log into your bank or steal your identity. You may not have heard about this, but AT&T just revealed that at least 73 million of their customers' records were leaked onto the dark web, including current and former customers. They obviously recommended that anyone affected switch to stronger passwords, watch their account activity closely, and even consider freezing their credit cards and monitor fraud alerts. The cool thing is, Aura can help me do all of this, meaning I don't need to download a bunch of different apps to get this issue resolved. My info was personally involved in this data leak, but I'm not concerned in the slightest because I know Aura is working to keep me safe. I value my privacy, and I know you do too, so check out Aura.com slash tieknots to start your free two-week trial, or click the link below in the description. Thanks to Aura for sponsoring today's video. It was absolutely unlike Sierra to not return home at her scheduled time. Since this wasn't typical behavior, Marlene decided to immediately contact the school and Sierra's friends to ask if they knew where she was, but they informed her that she never showed up for school that morning, and Marlene immediately started to worry that something was wrong. If Sierra had made plans with friends, she would have told her mother not to expect her home that afternoon, but she hadn't left a message or told any of her friends that she had plans other than her usual routine. Her mother started to panic. She contacted the Santa Clara Sheriff's Office to file a missing persons report, and thankfully they took the case seriously. An investigation into Sierra's sudden disappearance immediately commenced, 
with the first order of business being to check her social media accounts. It was found that she posted a selfie to one of these accounts at around 7 a.m. and that she'd messaged one of her friends just 10 minutes later. In the texts, they agreed to meet at school before they had to attend class so that they could exchange makeup and homework. Nothing particularly eventful or unusual. Now, I could easily imagine that investigators are often asked to investigate similar cases to this, only to find that the missing person decided to skip school that day. But nothing suggested that Sierra had any such plans, since her school books and clothing were missing from the house, proving she'd likely taken them with her. She'd made plans with at least one friend to meet up at school, and so investigators decided to interview the bus driver that would have picked her up that morning. But this is where the case took a sinister turn. The bus driver reported that Sierra hadn't been at her stop that morning, and the students who were used to seeing her catch the bus at her usual location confirmed this. She'd seemingly vanished into thin air, but by this point, her case was merely being treated as a disappearance, since no evidence had been found to suggest that foul play was involved. But a search of the area turned up no clues, and so investigators decided to conduct another search the following day with the help of a canine unit. The dogs followed Sierra's scent along the route that she had taken to the bus stop every day, but about halfway there, her scent disappeared. This set off every alarm for investigators, as this indicated that she was either picked up by someone that Marlene didn't know about, or that she'd been taken against her own will. What was a regular missing person investigation at first had now turned into a possible kidnapping case, but there was still no evidence to follow up on. But this changed when another search of the area was carried out on the 17th of March by a search and rescue crew, arranged by the nonprofit organization Class Kids Foundation. In a field just a few blocks away from her regular bus stop, a search party stumbled across a clue. Sierra's cell phone had been found ditched in a nearby field, just a short walk from the unmarked bus stop. This was all the information police needed to conclude that Sierra did not vanish of her own accord. After police collected Sierra's cell phone from the field, it was sent in for a full forensic analysis. While awaiting the results, the following day, even more worrying evidence emerged when Sierra's purse, school books, and clothes that she was wearing were all found hidden in a shed less than two miles from the family's house. Marlene was now convinced that something untoward had happened to her daughter, but she did her best to remain hopeful. When the clothing was checked, it was found to be heavily stained by dirt, and it reeked of urine. A grim picture was starting to emerge in Marlene's mind, and it wasn't one that any parent would ever want to imagine. The evidence suggested that Sierra was indeed abducted, and that her cell phone was then thrown out of a moving vehicle, and that she'd been dragged through the dirt at some point before her belongings and clothes were placed in the shed in an attempt to hide them from investigators. But the mystery of her whereabouts was yet to be solved, so DNA swabs were taken of all of the found items. When the results came back, they revealed that there was foreign DNA present on Sierra's clothes, so the samples were sent to CODIS, the national DNA database. This is when the first true breakthrough in Sierra's case came in. The DNA found on her clothes matched that of a 20-year-old man named Antolin Garcia Torres, who lived about seven miles from Sierra's house. The police immediately placed a 24-hour surveillance on him while they checked CCTV footage of the areas that Sierra was thought to have been in that morning. This is when they discovered that a red 1998 Volkswagen Jetta could be seen driving around Sierra's neighborhood that morning. And when it came to light that Torres drove that same make and model car, his vehicle was seized for evidence. When his car was searched, it became clear he definitely had something to do with Sierra's disappearance. Torres was adamant that he had never met Sierra, nor did he have any idea what had happened to her. But despite his objections, he was taken into custody and charged with kidnapping, as well as claiming Sierra's life, despite there being no evidence that she lost her life at this point. As you could probably expect, Torres pleaded not guilty. By this point, you can only imagine the state of mind Sierra's mother and friends must have been in. Not only from the distressing evidence that was found, but from the sheer uncertainty of where Sierra was, whether she was alive, and what happened to her after she was abducted. Since she hadn't been located yet, the prosecution in the case had to purely rely on circumstantial evidence that had been discovered, but despite this, they pushed for Torres to receive the harshest possible sentence, capital punishment. 
To make matters worse, there were no witnesses who could testify one way or the other. No weapon had been found in his car or in his possession. And since no autopsy could be performed, the prosecution didn't really have much to go on. Regardless, they pushed on, suggesting to the court that Torres had carried out the crime and that his motives were sexually driven. They were certain of this much and pointed to answers he gave during his interrogation that were sexual in nature, despite the fact that the questions posed to him were not. Since Sierra's clothing had been removed and nothing of value in her possession was proven to be stolen, it certainly wasn't a mere robbery, since her lunch money was still in her purse. If someone had mugged her, they would certainly have taken the purse with them, then gotten rid of it later on after taking whatever they wanted from it. But that just wasn't the case here. The court then heard that Torres' car was not only captured by security cameras near Sierra's house, but was also seen in the area where her possessions were found and it was now all but certain that he was the one responsible for her disappearance. At the very least, he likely knew more than he was letting on. But still, we have to admit that at this point, all of this evidence was pretty circumstantial. Prosecutors were going to have an incredibly hard time convicting a man who they didn't really have any tangible evidence against, other than the fact that he'd been in the wrong place at the wrong time, along with some offhand comments made during an interrogation. They were going to need a lot more than this if they wanted to put this man behind bars. But thankfully, they were about to get their wish. Knowing that all of this evidence they had against Torres could be considered as circumstantial at best, detectives knew that they had to keep looking. And that's when they found it. As police combed through every square inch of Torres's car, they finally found something a rope in the trunk of his car. When this rope was sent in for forensic testing, it was found to contain trace amounts of Sierra's DNA, a girl who Torres claimed he knew nothing about. Well, if he'd never met her before, then why was her DNA in his trunk? Torres claimed he had an alibi for that morning. He claimed that he was on a fishing trip at the time that Sierra went missing. But the prosecution quickly pointed out that there was a five hour discrepancy in the story in which he could have easily abducted Sierra carried out the crime, and then disposed of any evidence, including her remains. All of the evidence, despite being circumstantial, pointed to Torres, including the DNA that was found on her clothing, as this was soon discovered as to have belonged to him. But here's where things get a bit, well, weird and gross. See, Torres had an explanation for that theory as well. So Torres claimed that early that morning, he'd been driving around in his car and taking care of himself, so to speak, he said that once the deed was done, he threw a tissue that he'd used out the window, and this tissue must have landed on Sierra's clothing, which in turn placed his DNA on her clothing. But there's one major problem with this alibi. Police never publicly mentioned what type of DNA was found on her clothing. So how did he know what type of bodily fluid it had come from? As the trial continued, Torres' sordid and disturbing past was revealed, and it soon emerged that he had a history of violence against women. Three other women, an 18-year-old, a 46-year-old, and a 36-year-old, had all accused him of attempting to kidnap them in the past while they were sitting in their cars in a parking lot. At the time of those instances, Torres was employed at a local Safeway store, and he had on three separate occasions attempted to abduct women in the store's parking lot. All three of these attempted kidnappings took place about three years before Sierra's disappearance, which leaves us wondering whether he ever carried out any other successful abductions that were either never reported or never attributed to him. It really makes you wonder. Whatever the case may be, during an investigation into one of those attacks, a stun gun that was intended to be used on one of the victims was found at the scene, and it was thoroughly processed at a crime lab. Inside, they found a battery that contained Torres' fingerprints, and the prosecution claimed that this was irrefutable proof that he was the one responsible, despite the fact that none of the women could pick him out of a lineup. To counter this, the defense argued that Torres' fingerprints could have easily ended up on that battery since he worked at the Safeway store and regularly restocked some of the shelves with battery packs that had been torn open. But let's be real, this was a bit of a long shot. Torres' lawyer also added that no one had been able to prove that Sierra was no longer alive or that Torres had anything to do with her disappearance since all the evidence that had been processed so far, as we all know, was circumstantial minus the rope, 
the DNA, the CCTV footage, the history of violence, it was clear that Torres' defense team was beginning to grasp at straws. But the story still isn't over yet, not by a long shot. Torres' defense team asked the court to consider the possibility that Sierra had merely decided to run away from home, since it was known that she wasn't happy about relocating to a new area, and had to adapt to an unfamiliar school environment after all. Interestingly, this theory actually had a small amount of merit. One of Sierra's teachers at her previous school was called to the stand to testify. She stated that Sierra had returned to her former school on one occasion just to spend time with one of her friends, though she was only on the premises for about five minutes. This happened a few weeks before she vanished. Who was to say that this couldn't have happened again, but that Sierra had either decided to permanently run away this time, or worse, something had happened to her while she skipped town to go back to her old school. The defense team argued that this was proof that Sierra was desperate to get her old life back, and that she just wanted to move back to her hometown with her old friends. While this certainly made a small amount of sense, the theory wasn't backed up by any tangible evidence. It was nothing more than a theory. Sierra had never mentioned wanting to run away to either her mother or her friends, but the defense had an explanation for that as well. Next, they wanted to call Sierra's character into question, and they began to claim that Sierra may have had ties to organized crime. In an effort to prove this theory, the defense called some of Sierra's former school friends to the stand, and they reluctantly admitted that she had, on occasion, taken illegal substances. One friend added that on the day before she disappeared, she texted her saying she was looking forward to coming back to Fremont, where she intended to take pills once again. And this was not a good look. Her friends also confirmed that she was despondent about having to move away, but they never felt that she had any intention of running away, since she was still able to visit them whenever she wanted. Following these revelations, the defense suggested that Sierra had been abducted and lost her life to drug dealers in the area since she likely would have had to deal with them to acquire the substances that she'd used. While this theory makes perfect sense, it was far more likely that she got those substances from someone who'd already purchased them from a dealer. But the defense had to use whatever flimsy theories they could, since the evidence against Torres was virtually irrefutable. Further proving this was their opinion on the evidence that was collected at the different scenes where Sierra's belongings were found. They claimed that the hair that was found on the rope in Torres's car wasn't present in evidence photos and hence could not have been present when the rope was collected. Essentially, they were suggesting that police had planted the evidence in the back of Torres's car. Or at the least, that's the impression I get from all this. They then shifted their focus to the sheriff who was involved in the case, stating that when the rope was found in Torres's car, it was taken in as evidence but wasn't booked in at the police station immediately, as was normal procedure. Since the bag was left to sit in the sheriff's garage in an improperly sealed bag overnight before being brought to the station the following day. This made it possible that cross-contamination may have occurred, which would render this DNA useless, basically. They also pointed to the fact that when Sierra's clothes were processed, nine strands of hair were found and placed in an evidence bag. Yet, that same envelope was later checked, and one of the strands of hair had inexplicably disappeared. Since this further suggested that the evidence had been improperly handled, they asked that the court disregard all the DNA evidence that had been presented up to that point. Next, they brought it to the court's attention that there was a witness who saw something suspicious that morning that had not been mentioned before. She told investigators that she saw a brown car pull over to the side of the road, close to the spot where Sierra normally got on the school bus. They claimed that since this lead was never properly followed up on, there's a chance that someone else may have abducted Sierra, and hence it could not be irrefutably proven that Torres was responsible. If I'm being honest, I've got to admit, this was not looking good for the prosecution. These were all admittedly very good points. While I think we can all agree that Torres was without a doubt somehow involved, well, these theories were not looking good, and it was beginning to look like Torres may be set free. The defense then started focusing on other charges that were brought against Torres, specifically regarding the other three kidnapping attempts. They pointed out that the same sheriff in charge of Sierra's case was found to be an unreliable witness in another unrelated case, since he'd mishandled evidence on that occasion as well, and the case had to be retried thanks to his incompetence. Hence, they asked that the other three charges against Torres be dropped, since the same sheriff was also in charge of those investigations. 
they had successfully shifted the focus of the case from the tragedy of Sierra, possibly losing her life, to the plight of their client. And unsurprisingly, they didn't ask Torres to take the stand, since he would then have needed to face questions from the prosecution that he may not have been able to answer without incriminating himself. Their last effort was to paint Sierra in a negative light. They claimed that she was an unhappy teenager who was in the habit of getting high, and that she may be alive somewhere and had likely just decided to run away from home or go out on some bender of some sort. It must have been incredibly hard for Sierra's family and friends to hear these claims, since they knew that they'd been taken out of context to fit with the defense's narrative. But they were hopeful that the jury would see Torres for the criminal that he was, and that he would be ordered to pay the ultimate price. At this point, no evidence had been found that indicated that Sierra was still alive. She left no note behind at home, never told any of her friends that she was planning to run away. And since she made plans with a friend to meet up at school on the morning that she vanished, it was extremely unlikely that she decided to up and disappear without so much as a word. She would also have had no reason to dispose of the clothes that she was wearing, and it would have been nonsensical for her to leave her phone lying in a field. This would have just been ridiculous. The fact remains that Torres' DNA was found on Sierra's clothing, and her DNA was found in his car, something that couldn't merely be argued away, regardless of the mishandling of evidence. Forensic analysis clearly proved that Torres had contact with Sierra that morning, and he knew where she was at least some of that time though he claimed to have never seen her before and they never had any interaction with her. It was now up to the jury to decide what was to become of Torres, who'd remained emotionless and silent throughout the trial. After deliberating for quite some time, the jury had finally reached a verdict. After all was said and done, Torres was found guilty of attempting to kidnap the three women from the Safeway's parking lot, and of attempting to use a taser during those attacks. Thankfully, he was also found guilty of ending Sierra's life, even though her remains had still not been found. But the defense still had other, even more outlandish tricks up their sleeve, and I just can't even wrap my head around this one. When the time came for Torres to be sentenced, the defense suddenly claimed that there was a chance that Torres may have been exposed to pesticides when he was a child, and that these chemicals may have had an effect on his personality and actions, meaning he couldn't be held responsible for the crimes he had committed. His mother, Laura Torres, then chimed in and added that he'd grown up in an abusive home with a father who was an alcoholic, and was known to have abused Torres when he was young, along with several other family members. She noted that his father was now incarcerated for life after he was found guilty of abusing one of their family members, and that this behavior would have had a negative effect on Torres, who she described as a responsible and loving person, who protected his family after losing his brother, who'd been arrested and deported on drug charges before passing away. But let's be real here. All these allegations did was prove that Torres came from a family with a significant history of illegal activity and violence. This didn't in any way prove that Torres could possibly be innocent. It just proved that his other family members may have influenced him, leading Torres down the exact same path. Bad company corrupts good morals. It's not a complicated concept. Obviously, the courts were not having it. In the end, Torres was sentenced to 13 years and eight months behind bars for the three kidnapping attempts at the Safeway store. But in Sierra's case, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Speaking to Torres after the sentencing, Marlene told him that he could still find some semblance of redemption by revealing where he left Sierra's body. But Torres still refuses to admit guilt in this case even after all this time has passed. Sierra's father, Steve, pointed out that Torres also had daughters of his own, and he found it impossible to understand how someone with children could consider ending the life of someone else's child. He ended a statement by adding, after what he did, not saying, not telling where Sierra is and what happened, I hope it eats away at him while he's in there, while he rots in prison. Sierra's case is one that should have never happened, but it serves as yet another warning that there are many very dangerous people in this world who only have their own interests at heart. Torres stole a young girl's life just to give himself a few short minutes of pleasure. If this weren't bad enough, he could have spared her family a lot of heartache by at least revealing where he hid her remains, but he chose to maintain his innocence despite clearly being the one who ended her life. Sierra's family has stated that they will keep searching for her remains until she's found, at which point they plan to hold a proper burial for her and give her the send-off that she deserves. 
But for the time being, they're attempting to deal with the fact that Sierra is gone, while her attacker, a clearly disturbed man, continues to live on. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.